Hey, Adam Richardson, lead pastor at Sandhurst. We are so thankful that you have joined us here on this live stream on your device, and we have prayed that it would be an encouragement and a blessing to you on your journey. If you are a part of the local Sandhurst family, would you reach out to us and let us know who you are if you're unable to visit for any period of time, because we want to maintain our connection to you and our care for you. If you're outside the local Sandhurst family, then we welcome you here. Um, at the same time, we hope this will not replace, but only supplement the care and the teaching you receive from your leaders in your church. And if you would like to know more about starting or renewing a relationship with God through Christ, please definitely reach out to us at the number or the email below and we'll be in touch. If you enjoy this, would you please post or share this link so others can enjoy it as well. Thanks again for joining us. We trust it's an encouragement for you. Enjoy. My name is Jennifer, and our passage today comes from 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6. It's found in the Church Bibles on page 859. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly, earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Will. I'm the youth minister here, and it's good to be with you every time we gather. I wasn't able to be here last week, but I joined in online, and it's just really good to be able to celebrate with the church, even though I was just kind of watching on a little screen, but to be able to celebrate the work that God has been doing in the lives of people here, to take hearts that are dead and or just hard and breathe life, and to be able to praise Him for that. And I'm really, really grateful for the work of God in that way, and, and glad to be part of it as part of the church here at Sandhurst. We are in First Peter, and it's been really good so far. Here's what we've seen. We've seen Peter, the guy who was following Jesus, the guy who was quick to act, not so much to think before he act, and now he's writing to the churches, and he's writing to churches as he's seeing trouble is on the horizon. It is coming, and in some ways, it has already arrived. And what he opens the book doing is he's trying to arm them with hope-filled gospel truths that will allow them to endure through suffering. So he's writing about this inheritance that we have that's unfading, undefiled, won't perish, and will, it lasts forever. And he's like, hey, be encouraged. There's this gospel, this good news is something so good. Angels long to look into this. And so, yes, endure. And as you're enduring, here's how we're going to do it, as aliens and strangers in the world. Aliens and strangers. Alien, uh, stranger, not as in like um, an exile, as in like, uh, you know, a, an isolated victim, but an alien as in what we've been saying, supernaturally distinct. And so he just writes in the letter about, here's, our, here's how, here's what it's going to look like to live as an alien in all different areas of life, from the workplace to the family. And then what he keeps coming back to is, here's what it's going to look like to live as an alien through suffering because I see trouble coming, and I want you to be able to endure. So it makes sense, you know, as we study, we don't want to just study ever, just to study, so that we can just kind of feel good about ourselves that, you know, we studied through First Peter and however many weeks we're doing it. I think, I think if, if God could be like right here, and he could be speaking to us, he'd say something like, yes, study First Peter. 
But the goal of studying is that my church would increasingly be supernaturally distinct. So here's, here's, a, here's a thought. Um, I don't know how many weeks we've been in this. So let's, call it, let's call it eight. It's probably, doesn't matter. Over the last eight weeks, would you say, I think I'm more supernaturally distinct than I was when we started? <laughs> Uh, I hope so. And to the degree that that's true, it's been by God's grace. And to the degree that there has been failure and there has been much, we turn back to God's grace. So it is God's grace that empowers and it's God's grace that forgives. And so either way, as we have our sights set on being who we are, supernaturally distinct strangers, uh, God's grace is is at the thick of it. All right, so for this morning, here's what we're going to see in chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. He's going to give a command, and really everything centers around this command. After he gives the command, he's going to give three reasons for why we should do that. And then he's going to give some results of what happens when we do that as well. To be honest, there's a lot of things in this passage that, (laughs) um, without like— you know, being too, uh, I don't want to come across as disrespectful, but if I was in the room with Peter writing these verses, I'd be like, hey, Peter, well, let's, let's try to rewrite that one so it's a little bit more clear to what you mean, because I'm not really sure. There's a, there's a number of phrases like that, and I think you'll see it as we go through, but what isn't unclear is this, what he wants what he's calling the church to, and it's also not super unclear the reasons as to why. So let's, let's jump in, and as we do that, let me um, ask God to help us um, not just study, but be doers as well as hearers. Father, um, man, we want to come before you now, as we have been this morning in, in worship, and we want to say, God, you are our God. And we're your servants, and so we place ourselves under the authority of your word. I pray that we would be a grace-based people who are supernaturally distinct. And I pray that your spirit would, would accomplish that work increasingly so this morning. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so he's over the last few verses, he's been talking about what alienness is going to look like in all these different settings. Now he's going to turn to a command that's going to give sort of the disposition of alienness. All right, so chapter 4, verse 1. Here we go. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, here's the command. Arm yourself. All right. So that, that, that so much is, uh, is pretty clear. What's the command? The command is to arm yourselves. So, this is like, man, if you're a gun-shooting American, this is like, yeah, baby, this is, this is my kind of verse. I like Peter now. And we can kind of feel this with Peter. I mean, Peter was, he was armed when Jesus was arrested, right? And, and he knew as Jesus was heading into his suffering, yeah, I'm going to arm myself. And not just, this is like, not just my bark is going to be bigger than my bite. No, like, I'm going to come for your face and hit your ear, but I'm still coming for your face. All right? Arm yourself. So here's what I think. When I think arm myself, I'm thinking, okay, baby. All right. I, dude, I love this passage. Let's do it. Get your weapons, baby. Arm yourself. Now, arm ourselves with what? What does he say? Yeah, you arm yourselves with the attitude of Jesus. Arm yourself with the attitude of Jesus. The, your Bible, if, if you're reading NIV, it says the attitude of Jesus. ESV says the same thinking. My Bible says the same purpose. The, the word just, it means exactly that. It means this, this thinking. So for aliens to live alienly, Here's, how, here's the disposition that's going to be behind that. You're going to arm yourself, all right? And here's what you're going to arm yourself with. 
not with weapons, bam, 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 bam. We're going to arm ourselves with an attitude, with a mindset, with a mentality, with a way of thinking. And that mindset, mentality, way of thinking is going to be the mentality of Jesus. So if we're going to arm ourselves that way, we have to know, okay, well, then what is, what is the attitude of Jesus with which I'm supposed to be armed? So we don't have to like look far. If just, just listen to 1 Peter 3, 18, just rewinding a little bit, and this is going to articulate the attitude of Jesus with which I arm myself. All right, 1 Peter 3, 18 says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. So what does that say about the attitude of Jesus with which I arm myself? Don't answer yet. If we're going to arm ourselves with the attitude of Jesus, maybe another passage comes to your mind about the attitude of Jesus that would help us sort of understand, okay, how am I arming myself? This Philippians 2 maybe comes to mind, where Paul in Philippians 2 says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. All right, I'm gonna, I want to talk through Philippians 2, and we're asking ourselves, what's the attitude? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, like held to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what's the attitude of Jesus? According to 1 Peter 3.18 and Philippians 2. There's, probably, there, there's a lot of ways you could answer that rightly. It definitely, the attitude involves humility, right? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself to the point of death. It involves humility. Um, it involves obedience, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. It involves suffering. Whatever this attitude is, it involves those, thing, those things. Hum, humility, obedience, and suffering. And so, and as I was trying to think, you know, an image, when I was originally thinking, arm yourself, you know, I, th I tend to think in visuals. And so I was like, oh man, this is great. This is like the time to bring every weapon I own up on stage. And we're like, yes, yes. But arm yourselves, how? Arm yourselves. Don't think gun or sword. Arm yourselves with the attitude of Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. You know, arm, aliens going to be armed? We love our guns. That's not, that's not going to be it for an alien. Just picture this at like the, you know, we need a holster for this. No, there's no concealing this. Just, this is, this is the attitude that I make. Here, here's how the language I want to use for it this morning. Humble Submission through suffering. This is the attitude of Jesus. Humble submission through suffering. This is, this is what, how Jesus was. Humble. Submitted to the Father, no matter the cost. This is the attitude of Jesus. And I think we need, we need to see this as, how, as, as the primary weapon that aliens are armed with, because if if we get lazy in Christians, if we don't arm ourselves in this way, we are predisposed to something else. And a way to visualize it is, is this. This is my face, okay? Um, Normal face? What, what would you call this? Proud, big-headed, puffed up. Right? That's what this is. 
I, I would call this version of me, which does come out, this version of me is like the me monster me. It's the me that demands my way. It's the me that says, hey, I'll, I'll serve if it's fun, depending on who's there and if there's food provided. Like this is, this is it's all about me. And this is what we are, pre- like, we are predisposed to the big headed me monster. Hey, if I feel it, I'll do it. If I'm feeling it, good. If I feel it, I believe it because my, me and my feelings, they dictate everything that I do. If I'm feeling it, I'll do it. This is what I'm predisposed, what I'm, what is the, my default position is this. And he's going, if this is, if this is your default position, and so you need to arm yourselves with the attitude of Jesus because it is very difficult for this person to do this, empty himself, unless it's for this, right? To be seen and applauded and praised. Arm yourself with humble submission to God. Yes, Lord, to whatever he says, no matter the cost. This is how we arm ourselves. And I just want us to know right off the bat, when we, when we are lazy about arming ourselves at home and in our families, at school, what's going to... This is the alternative. Me! And just, you know, I know we already talked about marriage, and so I'm not trying to, like, go back too much. But when... Ha! Ha! This is my wife, all right? When this and this are together, then, then I'll, I'll just keep speaking for myself. Um, w- this guy is easily irritated, offended quickly, slow to forgive, will hold a grudge, because me, you offended me. And how dare, do you see, how dare you? This is what happens when we are not armed with the attitude of Jesus. Humble submission to God, even through suffering, no matter the cost. That's why I said, you know, he's been talking about what it's going to look like to be supernaturally distinct in these various areas of life. But now he's going to the the disposition behind what you see, and it's this. It's just somebody who's been armed. Lord, um, I'm coming home from work right now, and here's here's my mentality. I'm going to be humbly submitted to you, no matter the cost. We're just going to, well, we'll get there, but um, this is me. This is how aliens arm themselves. And we need it. So, um, having seen the command and identified the attitude, which uh, the language we're going to use is humble submission through suffering, he's going to give some reasons for why to be armed in that way. And they don't necessarily follow, like, sequentially in the passage. The first reason for this actually comes right before the, the command. So, reason number one, chapter four, verse one, therefore, Since Christ has suffered in the flesh. So the therefore, you know, what is it there for? You've got to look back. But then after he says therefore, he tells tells us what he's saying therefore for. So arm yourselves. Why? Since Christ has suffered in the flesh. So reason number one, uh, humble submission through suffering. That's what H-S-T-S stands for. Humble submission through suffering is what Jesus did. Since Christ has suffered in the flesh. Jesus suffered in the flesh. And when we think about that, we rightly think about he, you know, to the point of death. That's how he obeyed. That was the cost of his obedience. But there's other things that Jesus said yes to the Father to that had sort of a price tag on it, right? Lots of miracles, lots of um, times where he touched people who weren't supposed to be touched. And there was a price tag on that for his reputation, um, 
And no, no matter what, from, from the big cross to I'll go to that party um, to interact with those people, uh, to show them love, or I'll stop and notice this bleeding woman who wants to remain invisible. Like, all these different things where Jesus goes, hey, um, I'm just going to say yes to the Father, no matter the cost, whether it's to my life, or to my reputation, or to what seems convenient, or what would be, uh, seems like would be nice for sleeping. I'm just, yes, Father, yes, Father no matter the cost. It's what Jesus did. And what Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, hey, take my yoke on you and learn from me. In other words, whatever I've done, learn from me doesn't mean put some notes in. What does learn from me mean? Do what I did. So if I could give this an image, I'd say, here's our image. Why arm myself with this attitude? Because that's what he did. And I'm one with him. So take my yoke, I'm taking my yoke on, his yoke on me in learning. To humbly submit through suffering, um, because that's what Jesus did. That's, that's the first reason. The second reason comes right after. Chapter 4, verse 1. We're really squeezing verse 1. <laughs> Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, that's reason 1, because of that, Arm yourself also with the same purpose. Because, here's the second reason, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Okay, pause there. So what's the second reason? Because he who arms himself like this, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So at that point, I'm like, okay, so Peter, wait, wait. So you mean like, he who has died, physically died, now they're glorified, and now sin's not an issue for them anymore because they're in their glorified state. He'd be like, well, no, because um, right after this, I'm going to talk about how they continue leave, living. So they're not dead. I'm like, okay. So you mean to say that anybody who arms himself has, NAS says, has ceased from sin? They'll never sin again? He'd be like, well, n- no, I don't. They'd be like, take him, Peter. What do you mean? Um, Arm yourself this way because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin or is done with sin. Here's what I think Peter is saying. Arm yourself in this way. Here's why. Because he who has suffered, you know, in humble obedience to God, he who has suffered in the flesh um, is free from sin because this suffering in submission to God purifies Last time I got to um, speak up here, I told, I told you I was going to quote Hal Irvin a bunch because he taught through First Peter with us, um, with the students, a few months ago. And he said this over and over again, and it really stuck with me. Honestly, I don't remember if it came from this verse, but it could have. He said, suffering, it often feels like punishment. And it does. Whatever form the suffering comes in, whether it's directly connected to, like, because I've obeyed Jesus, or just because it happened, and there's no real explanation that we can see. Whatever the, whatever the case, suffering feels like punishment. What Peter's saying is, he who has suffered in the body has ceased from sin. Suffering isn't punishment, it purifies. That's why the Bible talks about suffering being like fire. Fire that refines. And so, the if if you were to think of your own story, you'd probably be like, oh yeah, that is true. If you were going to think about the times where God has sanctified you the most, has grown you into being this kind of person the most, it's that there's probably going to be some like high moments, maybe at like a retreat or some sort of conference or something, but probably where God did the most work in you and conforming you into the image of his son was in some sort of deep valley, some sort of deep hard, where you look back and go, oh, that's, that's when God grew me. The, th- this is very trivial compared to most things maybe not most, many things in life. Um, When I was a uh, 
senior in high school, we, did, we were doing power-up clubs, and we had night sessions, and somebody was speaking at the night, session, the night sessions, and the guy was talking about the sovereignty of God. He gave three points on the sovereignty of God, and I was like, yeah, this is good. And then senior year, the girl and I that were like, we were kind of like dating but not dating, but then we kind of broke up and, you know, one of those things, and I was like crushed, and I was like really, 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 really sad, like really, and... And it was in that lowness that, I, that my heart started being like, God, I, I, I need something right now. And, and I started thinking about power-up clubs, and I started thinking about the sovereignty of God. And I called up my friend who I was like, this friend is going to know what was said that night because he, like, you know, he listened like, really well. And so I was like, I said, Jeff, dude, I'm not, I'm in a low moment right now. What did we say about this? the sovereignty of God, and he said, oh, well, here's what we said. Because God is sovereign, nothing happens by chance. Because God is sovereign, everything that touches me is intended to be used by God to make me more like Jesus, and because God is sovereign, it's good to be a child of God. So, now I'm 32, and I can still give three points about the sovereignty of God. And it wasn't because the guy speaking was so good. At what point did the sovereignty of God become something that was go- like sanctifying to me? At what point? In the low. And, and really, I, yeah, in the low. So yeah, arm yourselves with this attitude. Why? Because this, through suffering, is going to be one of the ways that God purifies you. I've had this on, as the background of my phone for a long time. It's something that we said at Power Up Clubs. It's just really stuck with me. Um, hard isn't bad. It's just hard. And hard is where things grow. Like diamonds. And, um, and so a student actually made that a while back, and it's just been on the background of my phone. Just as a reminder, at what God does in the midst of the hard for the sake of his people. Purify. So since Christ has suffered in the body, what? Arm myself with the attitude of Jesus. What's a reason? Because he who has suffered like this is free from sin. He's purified. God's going to use that. There's a third a reason for arming yourself with the attitude of Jesus. Go, uh, we'll, we'll go back to verse 1. <laughs> Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Why? Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For the time, here, here's the third reason. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Okay, so what's the third reason? The third reason that he says, arm yourself like this, is because the time, because the time past is already sufficient for you to have lived any other way than this. Pursuing everything I want in this manner, he's going, you have spent enough time like this. It's time for this. And so if, if you became like a Christian when you were like five, what about the five-year-old? Have they spent enough time in this way? For him to go, oh no, enough time has been spent doing this, time, time for this. I think Peter would be like, yes, enough time is spent. Because any time living like this is too much time living like this. You are an alien. So here's how we arm ourselves. The time past is sufficient for anything else. This is, this is the third reason he has for arming ourselves. Okay. So these are the reasons, and now he's going to talk about some, some results of 
aliens who live armed. And here are the results. He's going to, oh, there's, there's the visual. This is, this is helpful to me in, in China, grasping First Peter 4. So here are the results. He's going to give some, al- some results for armed aliens and some results for unbelievers. Let's, let's look at them. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 now. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. By the way, I keep reading it because there's not a lot of verses, and we can, and it's good for us to see what he's saying. I want us to see this more than, you know, the fancy little picture, okay? Verse 1, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose. Why? Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the will of God. That's one result. For the time has already passed, is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Just six worldly things. Verse 4, here's another result. In all this, they, that would be unbelievers, in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. Verse 5, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Arm yourself. Here's the result. Armed aliens will live no longer for evil desires, but for the will of God. That's what he says. Arm yourself like this, and you will discover that you are living God's will which means that saints, aliens who are armed like this, they have lost, they've rid themselves of the you-do-you thing as it pertains to morality. All right, so when it comes to where you want to go to lunch, you do you. All right, when it comes to how you cook a steak, well, that is more objective, but uh, it should be medium rare or rare. But, but you do you. Okay, so there are lots of things that, yes, you can say you do you, and you don't need to be like, ah, you do you. But aliens who live like this have lost the right to apply you do you to anything pertaining to morality. And what he talks about, and the six things that he talks about, they can be categorized pretty easily into like sexual sin and drunkenness. And he's like, when it comes to these things and things like them, there is no, I mean, well, just you do you. It's like, you do you, and this, they don't go together. And when it comes to drunkenness, this is not a you do you issue. When it comes to giving, this is not a you do you. Saints, aliens who have armed themselves with the attitude of Jesus, humble submission through suffering, will live the will of God in such a way where they've stopped applying that phrase in moral areas. No, no more you do you. Also, armed aliens will be surprisingly different. That's what he says. In all this, they're surprised. Hmm. Has, that, has anybody been surprised by you? Hmm, that's different. Almost like distinct. Alien. <laughs> um, in all this, man, here's the result. The church will be um, making the world go, I don't get that. That doesn't make sense to me. Be surprisingly different. Results for the unbelievers. Unbelievers will <laughs> heap abuse on you. And you know what, man? We just need to expect it and embrace it as, um, as Christians that right now in our country, you know, at least in our area, the, the, the most we can probably expect is somebody like teasing us or making fun of us or um, just kind of a, yeah. He's writing to people who they're expecting more, but whatever the case, we can expect, you know, unbelievers to, I think my Bible says malign, NIV says heap abuse. 
we can expect this. This is part of what happens to those who live like this. It happened to Jesus. I'm yoked with him. It purifies, and the time passes sufficient for anything else. And unbelievers will be judged. That's what he says. Verse 5. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So, um, the... The judgment of God is not like something that we love to talk about, but it's real. The judgment of God is not mean. It is God's holiness burning away anything that's contrary to his nature. And, and it's real. And because it's real, this is what he says, verse 6. For this reason, if you're reading NIV, for this reason, NAS says, for the gospel has for this purpose been preached. For what purpose? Because the the judgment is real. Divine judgment is real. Because of that, the gospel has been preached even to those who are dead. (laughs) What, Peter? Uh, Yeah, has been preached even to those who are dead. That though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. All right, that one was a little difficult for me. Um, but here's what is clear. D- divine judgment is real, and for this purpose, the gospel has been preached not to the dead, but to those who were alive and are now dead. A message of hope and forgiveness, a way of escape, if you will, from divine judgment. And that way of escape is not um, trying to be a good person and um, make sure that my good outweighs my bad. The way of escape is Jesus. That Jesus was, he is the propitiation, the, the one who satisfies God's wrath, who stands between. There's a way out. And that gift of salvation is something I receive by grace through faith. And so it helped me as I was reading other translations. Here's the way New Living Translation um, does verse 6. Here's how they translate verse 6. That is why, because divine judgment is real, that is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So they were alive, now they're dead. So although they were destined to die, like all people are destined to die, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. I think, I think that's what verse 6 is saying. The gospel is preached, so yes, suffering. And yes, life after. And this is good news for us. And it makes sense then for, as, as Peter, Peter lands, at least verse 6 here, with the gospel, that, that we would celebrate the gospel with communion. So I want to invite the guys to come up. Communion is God's symbol, where he's like, okay, yes, your picture, your picture is nice. But something far more important than the picture that's going to declare life from death is the bread and the cup. And part of the hope we have is no matter the suffering, the, the worst that can happen is like, I don't know, 80, 80 years of pain and then life with God forever. So I was listening to uh, the Chronicles of Narnia with my girls, and I think it was in the last battle. We've listened to a couple now, but I think it was in the last battle, or maybe Prince Caspian. They were talking about, hey, what happens when you die in Narnia? And in my mind, I was like, well, and I don't know, but I was like, if you die in Narnia, then no big deal. You're back, you're, you're back home where you're meant to be. And I just caught myself being like, why, why, are, why would they be afraid at all of dying in Narnia? They're just, if they do, they're just going to go back home. They're going, they're going to go back to where they were meant to be. So, I know there's maybe some distraction right now, but is anybody seeing the parallel of like, like that with life? Me being bothered that they would be upset at suffering in Narnia because at some point they're just going to go back to where... Is it, yeah, oh, okay, great. <laughs> I felt that, and then I felt convicted by my own um, thought process towards them. How could you be anything less than fully committed to Aslan's mission? I guess if you don't know anything about Narnia, this isn't making sense. So maybe that's part of 
part of the blank stares I'm getting right now. But the uh, fully committed to Aslan's mission, no matter the cost, because the worst that happens is I die and go back to where I belong. And, and that's, I think, where Peter's landing. Yeah, arm yourselves like this, because humble submission through suffering, no matter the cost, and it is gonna, it's, there's going to be a price tag on it, is not going to ultimately end in death. It's going to end in life. And so, as we celebrate communion, they're just symbols. They're symbols of Jesus' body broken, of his blood poured out to bring life out of death. And, and so then we come full, full circle, and we're remembering what Jesus did. He lived, he died a death he didn't deserve, and he rose again. And not just what he did in this, we're remembering what he accomplished. We're remembering that by the death of Jesus, by his wounds, we are healed. That he made a way for my sin to be done away with. So while I do sin, I stand before him as a saint, which means holy one. This is what we remember in communion, what he did and what he accomplished. And then what is inconsistent? What is in my life that Peter and God would say, the time is past is sufficient for this sort of nonsense. So you remember what he did. We remember what he accomplished and we confess the inconsistencies in our life. This is what we're going to do in communion. And we're just going to say thank you. Thank you, God, for what you did for what you accomplished and that I stand forgiven. 